Good morning, Church. Okay, so today's scripture reading is from Psalms 16, verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Happy Sabbath, Church. So I decided that after 25 years of just coming to church and listening to sermons, it was time for me to actually give a sermon. So the topic of my sermon today is reimagining joy. So those of you who know me know that I love a good joke and making people laugh. Well, a few weeks ago, I sent my friend a joke expecting him to laugh, as he usually did. But to my surprise, he replied back, this isn't really funny. I was confused because when I looked at it, I thought it truly was funny. I was even questioning this guy's character and asking myself if he was all right. Because the friend I thought I knew would have found it funny. So this conversation was the start of an interesting journey regarding joy and what makes us happy in the modern age. So there's no doubt that comedy is a large part of our lives. We can spend hours on Instagram and Facebook sharing memes and funny videos. I'm guilty of this. But when it comes down to it, this is mainly cheap, meaningless joy. So I decided to dig a little bit deeper into rediscovering what joy really is. So first, I turned to the prophetess Ellen White. So she wrote, I have been pained to hear so much joking and jesting among old and young as they are seated at the dining table. I have inquired, are these men aware that there is by their side a watcher who is disgusted with their spirit and the influence they exert and is making a record of their words and actions? All the sang Freud, which is so common, the theatrical gestures, all likeness and trifling, all jesting and joking, must be seen by the one who wears Christ's yoke to be not convenient, an offense to God and a denial of Christ. It unfits the mind for solid thought and solid labor. It makes man inefficient, superficial, and spiritually diseased. So much of our conversation when with friends is theatrical, light, and perhaps even trifling. It makes us happy in the moment. And in the moment, we can forget about the stressful job, the stressful boss, the upcoming exams, and the broken relationships. But afterwards, when we return home, the stresses of the world return. But I ask myself, God wants us to be happy, right? So while Satan would rather we derive our joy apart from God, that isn't God's plan for us. So the question is, how does God intend for us to find real joy? And what does joy look like to God? So let's turn to Psalms 16, verse 11, um, which reads, well, it's on the screen as well. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. Here it is in black and white. In your presence is fullness of joy. Not temporary joy, not half-hearted joy, but fullness. Everything we need. Amen? And as if that isn't enough, God adds a little extra on top of that joy. He adds pleasure, which is defined as a feeling of happy satisfaction and enjoyment. And he gives us this pleasure forever. So the happiness I relished from the last video my friend sent me is gone. But God tells us that he can do even better. The happiness that we find in him will last forever. So there's so much sadness and anger in today's world. This has to mean that people are deriving a form of happiness from sources apart from God. So I was curious to see what makes people happy today and I turned to a poll on Time Magazine, which asked people what's one thing in life that brought them the greatest happiness. So responders said that the greatest joy actually came from children at 35%, while only 11% said the greatest joy actually came from God. So I decided to survey some of my friends as well. So I chose only Christian friends um, for this survey, and I asked them what made them happiest in life. So answers included a reason 
So, no, I asked them, what's one thing that makes you happiest? The one thing. So answers included a reason to laugh, friends and family, love, money, warm food, weddings, being useful, and four out of 19 replied, God. So what's the problem here? What has happened so that we don't turn to God or see God as our primary source of joy? particularly because most of the items in the list, family, love, peace, usefulness, are given to us by God. Well, all signs point to our least favorite Bible character, Lucifer. So in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, it reads, Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And next, in John 10, verse 10, it reads, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So the devil is very smart. He convinces us to find joy in temporary and physical objects or beings while neglecting God as our primary source of happiness. And in putting our joy in physical things apart from God, we give the devil, the thief, the opportunity to steal away our sources of joy and plant sadness and bitterness within our hearts. The only thing that the devil can't steal away is our salvation and joy in the Lord, in the Lord. So if we find our joy in the Lord, we can be stripped of everything and still have hope. This isn't to say that we won't experience sadness in life, but... Through that sadness, God's everlasting joy and support will help us. So we can actually find examples of this within the Bible when we look at the story of Job, a rich man, both spiritually and in material, who was favored by God. Well, one day, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Everything was going well as they spoke to God about what was going on in their world. Then suddenly, I imagine a foul stench permeated the air. They looked at each other and groaned inwardly. There was only one person who brought about that stench of sin. And sure enough, here came Satan, presenting himself before God as well. And to think that after everything that God had done, I mean, sorry, after everything that Satan had done, God still allowed him to speak to him. So the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan replied, oh, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord decided to brag about one of his children, which would ordinarily be a very good thing. But today of all days was not the day you wanted God to brag about you because Satan was in the house. So the Lord replied, well, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? In other words, Job loves me and hates you, Satan. Well, Satan thought, we shall see about that. This was the chance he'd been waiting for. All these years, he'd been trying to destroy Job. But for God's protection, he, couldn't have, he could not harm a hair of Job's. Aloud, he replied, doesn't Job fear God for a reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. He held his breath, hoping against all hope that God would take the bait. Of course, God knew what Satan's intentions were. I mean, he'd been kicked out of heaven for a reason. But he decided that there was a greater work to be accomplished in Job. So he replied, Satan, sorry, he replied, Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. Satan's heart leapt with glee. Could it be? Had his wish truly been granted? Oh, the plans he had for Job. 
And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord before he could change his mind. Well, following that, Job lost everything that the Lord had blessed him with. Satan killed his children, destroyed his property, and attacked his health. And still, the Bible says that Job exclaimed, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Had Job not been mindful of the fact that it was God who was the source of the blessings and God to whom the glory belonged, then he would have been finished. But he knew that though he was without his material objects, his health, and even his beloved family, he could turn to God for his fullness and hope. During this time, he was not feeling joyful. But despite that, he still acknowledged and esteemed God above all because his heart and soul had never been within his property and his family, but in God. So I asked myself, what are some practical measures that we can take to shift our, to shift our mindsets so that we're more purposeful in seeking God as our primary source of happiness and fulfillment? Well, let's return to a reading from earlier. All this from Ellen White, she, where she wrote, all the sang Freud, which is so common, the theatrical gestures, all lightness and trifling, all jesting and joking, must be seen by the one who wears Christ's yoke to be not convenient, an offense to God and a denial of Christ. It unfits the mind for solid thought and solid labor. It makes man inefficient, superficial, and spiritually diseased. So when I read this, I really had to have a good think and truly consider how the memes and videos and empty careless jokes and banter affect the mind and make it unfit for spiritual thought. Much of the current humor is crude and honestly ungodly in nature. So when we meditate day in and day out on such things, our minds are molded to depreciate the value of what is holy. And we find ourselves barely being able to fit in a quick five or even 10 minute devotion, but spending hours on social media sharing and viewing entertainment. So Proverbs 13 verse 20 reads, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. This is to further say that when we fill our minds with fickle, unspiritual content, our minds become unspiritual and less able to appreciate and meditate on scripture. So what are some practical steps that we can take going forward to rewire our minds so that we would rather meditate on God's word or commune with God's people rather than browse YouTube or head to the club? So I came up with a few ideas. So um, first, we should be mindful who our friends are. Sorry, the writing is a little bit small. Um, so Proverbs verse 13, 20 again reads, walk with the wise and become wise, for companion of fools suffers harm. So we should take note of those that we spend our time with. Do they lead us to seek Jesus? And do they um, lead and uplift and inspire us? Are they God-fearing and honorable people? So we, we often find ourselves doing what our friends are doing. So we should choose friends who also bring us closer to Christ. So second, we should also guard our speech. Proverbs 17, verse 20 reads, He who is perverted in his language falls into evil. By keeping our language pure, we keep our minds pure and attract similarly minded people but we also positively impact and inspire our neighbors. So third, we should guard our minds and guard our thoughts. So Philippians 4 verse 8 reads, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. A lot of the media that we consume isn't pure, lovely, or admirable. 
So we may need to intentionally stop ourselves from watching certain types of media because it negatively impacts how we think and draws our minds away from meditating on God's word. Which brings us to our fourth point, meditate on God's word. So in Psalm 1 verse 2, it reads, But whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night? So let us delight in meditating on God's word, so much so that we do it continuously day and night, transforming ourselves to be filled with the spirit, that the word is is with us throughout the whole day and not only for a quick 10-minute slot that we sometimes fit in. So I've only given you a few tips regarding how we can rewire our minds so we are more intentional in seeking God and seeking our joy in the Lord. Life is tough, there's no doubt, but remember that in God we will find everlasting joy that material goods can't ever give us. So I'll leave you with one last verse. Psalm 4, verse 7. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. So let's remember to find our joy in the Lord. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us here today. And I pray that going forward, you may be with us throughout the week and that you may help us to find joy in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.